according to the sun, there were thousands of empty ecstasy wrappers littering the floor of the 250-foot-long hangar. Drugs, sex, sensation. Some newspapers have called Acid House Music a sinister and evil cult which lures young people into drug taking. The message is certainly getting across. The organizers kept the location secret until the very last moment, which was the main reason, according to the papers, why there were so few police here and they were unable to act. Drug crazed kids, some as young as 12, boogied for eight hours yesterday at Britain's biggest ever ecstasy bash. The party took place here infiltrated by reporters from the Mail and the Sun. There's, there's meant to be a drugs related craze. What do you know about acid house music? It must affect the brain in some way. Unless it's just the music that does it. Oh, All no. them lights flashing don't do you any good either, do it? Oh, I, I wouldn't even go in the no. pub where them lights are. Oh, no, they drive no. you mate, don't they? Welcome to the 88 podcast of yours truly, Wayne Anthony. I have to say, this is the first podcast and the first zoom meeting that i've ever done where i've been the host and i must say i'm happy to say that i'm doing it with one of the pioneers of house music one of the people that brought house music to the very forefront of the industry a cross from across from chicago it came to europe in a very short time but before i go on and on and give all the accolades to this man who has brought so much to the world today i just want to introduce tyree cooper yo Yes, Tyree. So I just want to say that we're broadcasting, we're using modern technology. Well, I love okay. the idea. Yeah, I love <laughs> this idea of this modern technology because I remember the idea of video conferencing because I know that you're a bit of a tech guy. And I know, you know, as far as. I'm a tech, secret, I'm a secret nerd. Yeah, yeah a bit of a nerd, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I heard a whisper, <laughs> you know. And I remember going back to the 90s. Mm. Yeah. And. You know, even right in 95, and there was this, everybody was talking about uh, video conferencing, you know. Right, and right, they, right. And it right. was so exciting. There were so many different companies that had claimed that they created oh, the technology. Man. Do you remember? Oh, yes. Yeah. Cisco. Because uh, yeah. uh, remember back in the day, the first, like, video calls, like, your phone would be in, in front of you at your desk, and this little, this little bitty little bitty screen to pop up and you can see this person just small little screen and color totally. but you had to use the you had to use the actual hand handheld to talk yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it had to be wired to the to the uh yeah. power source exactly yeah exactly you know? yeah exactly because yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. then uh it, it was kind of like the first actually it's what it, it was the beginnings of what this is if you look at it it was yeah, uh, sure. no one, sure. no one, no one, no one was talking in terms of uh, VoIP, right? VoIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol. But sure. somewhere in the uh, militaries, they found it a lot yeah. easier to call and undetected at this time. To there was one other. There was one other industry that found it quite useful as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was the porn industry, obviously. And the thing about the porn industry, yes. What, yes. What, yeah, you know, what many people don't realize is that they were driving a lot of the technology, even today. Even and today. in the 90s, it was the porn industry that was pushing this video streaming technology. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because you know, they, was, time. they was making buku yeah. money. They made money on top of money on top of, on top of, on, you know, yeah, if they could stack it in one, uh, one long stack, yeah, it'd be more stratospheres. Sure, and I remember at the time, you know, Microsoft, they were ruthless because I remember the technology, um, at the time I knew some people that were involved in the technology. Okay. Um, this is like 97, 98. Okay. So it, it was very fresh. And, and the idea was that uh, the way the, the porn guys were using it, that mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. is that they were users were able to access a website through the internet and then right. you know remotely operate someone That's else right. in a different country that where it was legal to actually have porn that's and right. so I, it was them that was driving that tech and i knew one company oh that was yeah porn. that's right i'm right yeah started. yeah i'm thinking now yeah. we're talking about, uh your virtual private networks and shit you know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean they were I mean, creating they, basically websites. Yeah, that, that's that's what I mean yeah. because if you, yeah. you talk about like, I don't know, if somebody's in Miami 
and uh, they doing this thing and they could, somebody in Poland. Where could, it was legal. Right, where it was legal, could chime in, <laughs> put their little money in and cha-ching, you know, credit card in the ass and just swipe left, yeah. swipe up, swipe down. Excuse my French, but, no, you know. No. Okay. And I mean, that's where the tech came from for the, all yeah. this video conferencing. Yeah, right, right. And, right. And, and, right. And, and even as a, I'll just go back to that chap and the chap that I knew that was involved in the industry. Mm. And what happened, they had legal sites where, you know, it was legal to have porn in Spain. But then right. they had, no they're really their market was in the States. And I remember, right. and I, I remember they bought some, this bit of tech and it was something to do with video compression and this, this, this bit of machinery, it was like over a million pound. Mm. And they bought this bit of tech and the company that they bought it from, like within about two months of them buying the tech, Microsoft came and bought the company and closed it down. <laughs> and they completely closed it down. And so that company, so they didn't, they didn't have the support that they needed. And you know, the industry moves so quickly Right. That that the whole thing didn't work. And then the next thing that Microsoft did was within six months, they they released the tech for free. And so it's it changed the industry, but the speed of uh, the internet wasn't quite there yet. Yeah, was it? You're right. You remember, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you know? right. So yeah, exactly. It wasn't quite yeah, there right. yet. Yeah, so right. You know, so when I see like on YouTube, they might have like Zoom calls and they'd be like mm. 30 or up to 100 people in a call. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we're we're lucky to have the speed to be able to do that because that was just a dream like twenty years ago. You know, even so, even 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 like like if you if you if you think about it, right? Like sometimes they say, uh, "Is art imitating life or life imitating art?" Right? In in a sense that uh, this uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger move. No, 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 no. Uh, 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 <clears throat> Wesley Snipes and Sylvester Stallone, Demolition Man, right? Yeah. When he got that video call on his on his TV because the girl was she was naked. She thought she was calling a boyfriend. She was going to surprise him. This was in 1993. Sure. And we talking sure. about we talking yeah. about. Uh, but you can go you can go back before banking. that even. I mean, look at William Gibson books. Y you know they 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 talk about that technology there, and, I, and I'm probably then, sure right. in you know those old sci-fi futuristic books. Yeah, the, so, the, so it's sci-fi is, is becoming sci-reality. Right, that's what I mean, you know. Well, yeah, even so. now, if you think about it, even now, in all the sci-fi films, it was the tech companies that ran the world. <laughs> you know? I mean, we're not that far away from that now, are we? No, really? we, no, 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 we're not that far. They, they're still trying to use uh, uh, yeah. fossil fuels to, you know, to get... Fossil fuels. Fuel. And I mean, again, there was that interesting documentary that was endorsed by... Um, uh, your man who made the nine eleven documentary. Oh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Michael Moore. Michael Moore. He yeah, recently, yeah. yeah, he recently endorsed the documentary. I think it was it called Planet of the Humans. Oh wow! Uh, I, of, of I was Planet almost in the, humans. I was almost. I was going to be in one of his. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, I was going to be. Uh, I, I would have been if had he did it in Berlin. I would have been one of the uh, people he interviewed for this documentary. Uh, I think it was the Health Planet Care. of the Humans. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah the no, Health no, Care. Was, but that was a while ago, yeah. It, no, this yeah. is that's what I'm saying. This is a while back because uh, yeah, yeah. one of his cameramen, one of his cameramen that he uses frequently when he comes to Europe or generally in America, or whatever. His child, his daughter, and my daughter went to the same. Uh, nursery or kita right in germany oh wow went to the same kita right so he oh, asked me if world. i wanted to do it yeah he asked me if i wanted to do it i'm like yeah how did you know who i am he said i looked you up on the internet and i found that you was kind of famous i was like oh wow <laughs> and that's and, and, that, and, that, and that's another thing just for people that might not know that you actually have european roots yeah you know? exactly exactly yeah exactly. i mean you exactly. you lived in germany for a while you know you you have in like german 19 kids. years yeah, yeah. I have a german child one german one german daughter uh half german half uh dual american. citizens yeah 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 she's uh she speaks perfect german perfect english you wouldn't be able to tell when she speaks 
but she has. What, so, I mean, what inspired that move then? I mean, you, well, you're, in, you're in Chicago, and New York. I suppose you could have been in any anywhere you wanted to be in the world at that point. And you know, when we think <laughs> about Germany, I mean, we love Germany, but when we think about Germany, we often think that of you know bad weather type thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, and right. It, right. It, you know, but I guess in reality, coming from Chicago. Well, I mean, you know, there's nothing, weather's nothing like it is in Germany as it is in Chicago. <laughs> so the first thing, okay, like, like, um, <clears throat> I, I got to a point, uh, I got, I kind of got to a point in Chicago, like, I wasn't getting any, I wasn't growing or there was, something was missing. I don't, I don't want to call anybody out or any particular thing. It, it, for me, something was missing. The, I, 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 I did the DJ International. Uh, the Dance Mania was really, really working for me. But uh, Chicago was changing. Um, you know, I wasn't, I always say I have this phrase, I wasn't invited to some of the reindeer games. So, you know, I felt there was no unity. And besides, I was doing most of my stuff in Europe because that, this particular time, the you know the the dollar value was more, and you know it was the illusion was you could make it there because the scene is there and so forth and so on, right? So that kind of prompted. So I used to go back and forth from like ninety six up until like ninety nine or something like that, somewhere up in there. For every six months, I go and come back, go and come back. Um, I would stay with friends and this, that, and the other. The UK, <laughs> boy, I tell you, them rough. I mean, rough. I, I mean, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, though, you know. So, but, but we're uh, talking about the UK, yeah, yeah, yeah but not, not in the. I'm, I'm not going because I love yeah. the UK. I, my family, uh, sure, is there. sure, right, right, right. So you know, where they're here, um, right, right, right. So, uh, uh. You know, it, it it wasn't bad. It, it you know they got to do what they got to do, basically. Yeah. But, but let's uh, let's let's go let's go back. Point, a I'm, bit. I'm, I'm, but, but yeah, I'm, yeah. Okay, but I'm, I'm gonna get to so so but yeah. so my choice how to get to Berlin, I got to Germany. So yeah, yeah, um, Berlin. Right. So yeah, that wasn't that that wasn't gonna be a thing. So I said no. Okay, UK. Since I'm a pothead, I said maybe Holland. You know, hey, Holland is cool. It's you know free and stuff. You know, it's all right. And I started looking at Holland as a whole because I was stayed in Amsterdam. Amsterdam is small. Holland is a smaller country. There was really no house at this at this particular time. Everything was fast. Didn't know what was going on. So um, I have a, a, a one of my best friends. Uh, name is Wayne Skipper, one of the most intelligent brothers. He, <laughs> anyway, um, Wayne's a like that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> dude, uh, in more ways than you don't even know. I think I mean, it's a pattern. <laughs> it, mu it, it must be because the Wayne's, uh, he was a DJ, he's a bass player, he played on a tour with uh, Body Count, things of this nature. And uh, he said, Hey, man, you should come to Germany and stay with me in Germany and in, in, in Munich. So I stayed in Munich for a little while. <laughs> no, can't go for that. Because <laughs> Munich is hardcore, so uh, so he so he was messing with these cats up in Berlin. So he said, "Hey man, you should think about moving to Berlin. It's a bit freer, so forth and so on." So I found a place in Berlin. Uh, he helped me find a place in Berlin um, for like my first year. He was kind of like, you know, guide me, make sure I uh, help me with the language, making sure I, I learned it and things of this nature. Um, the key was getting a couple girlfriends to speak German to you, so you can you can learn best it. way to talk. Um, so after a month being in Berlin, I wanted to leave and just say, fuck it, I go to Amsterdam. But after a little while, it kind of grew on me, kind of kind of reminded me of Chicago in so many ways. Shit, from that moment, from 2000 to 2019, it was Berlin. So sorry for the long, no, no. I had to go through the whole process because it was a lot of thought. And because in 1999, oh. I moved to Las Vegas too. So being here in Las Vegas, uh, from Chicago, it was techno, techno, techno. There was no house, and I didn't give my I didn't give myself enough time to explore all the possibilities because 
me getting a, a nine to five job just wasn't in the picture. Sure. <laughs> it just wasn't in the picture at this particular time. Sure. So I said, fuck it, I just go to Europe, man, and, and just, you know, hang out in Europe. So, because obviously, originally, I mean, you're probably tired of telling the story, but originally you had the scholarship to play basketball. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I mean, a scholarship is quite a big thing, isn't it? You know, it's not easy to get a scholarship. So scholarship uh, means that, that you must be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I played quite a bit of basketball uh, in my in my younger days. Um, but, you know, even which is kind of it's kind of funny because basketball helped me with how to how to how to direct my life in, in a way where uh, when I was little, I used to say I want to be famous like Richard Pryor. Right. That was mine. My idol. I want to be famous like Richard Pryor because he made me laugh. He could make people laugh. But being a comedian, it wasn't going to happen. I'm not that dude. Yeah. It been, it's not but... easy as well. I mean, don't get me wrong. I know you. I've known you for years. You're a funny guy. But I mean, no, stand up comedy is man, that's a, a hard whole, game. Man, that's a whole nother. Even if you think, you think you think yeah. you, that's another psychological job. But anyway, so I, I was like, uh, so I, I played a lot. I played a, poof, a lot of basketball. I'm not even gonna go down that road because uh, like, like my friends that I see now, that I talk to now, that we play ball against each other, I kind of downplay it and they'd be like, man, fuck that, man. Tell them what, to, you know, this, that, and the third. So yeah, I, I did play a lot of basketball. I went to the University of uh, Wisconsin Stout, right? Up in uh, Menominee, Wisconsin. And it's like so far north in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> Cause my whole thing was, I wanted to go to the NBA, right? Ugh, that's, yeah. a, that's so many. That's the dream. Yeah. yeah, and 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 this one, um, this one uh, basketball camp I went to. Uh, this this dude kind of broke it down, but you know, being young and from the hood, you don't you hear it, but you don't really pay no attention to it. You are like, I'm doing this. I, I I can't hear what you're saying. I'm I'm doing this. A man said, if you are between six nine and seven feet, you have one and 500 chances of making an NBA. Wow. If you are 6'8 to 6'5, you have one and 10,000 chance of making it. No, one in 5,000 chance of making an NBA. If you are 6'4 to 6 foot, you have one in 10,000 chances to make the NBA. If you are 6 foot and under, <laughs> <laughs> I went. So that's where you fit in. <laughs> right. One, I couldn't really dunk. Why well, I, I could I could one of my friends we, we just I can't even to be fair. Uh, oh man, I, I, with one of my friends, we laugh about this today. Like um there's there's a defense that the opposing team could put a defense on you, it's called a uh, a press. Like they do they have it they have it in football too, in, in soccer, right? Or football, soccer. I'm you know, I'm I'm both ways on that on that word. Um, they have a, a press or pressure they can put on the player and focus on the player so he can uh, make a mistake or pass it or kick it to somebody or kick it, you know, in soccer case, kick it to somebody else in basketball to make a dumb pass. I used to tell I used to tell the people move just 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 go ahead I I got this, and they look at me like, what? I'm like yeah yeah I got this I I got this I got this. And so you only have you only have eight seconds from the time you inbound the ball to half court, or it's a backcourt violation, right? Sure. So yeah, a lot of times, eighty percent, eighty-five percent, ninety percent of the time, I never got stuck up. I mean, I never got ripped for the ball. I always made it past half court in eight seconds or over eight seconds. No one can could get the ball for me. So yeah, I had handles is what they call. They had handles like not they they say uh breaking ankles, right? Yeah, this is one of the one of my features, which kind of led me to being the producer, if you look at it, right? A producer is like a point guard, right? He he sure. he he makes sure he has all the pieces to put together a a, a product or a team. Some cases a team or a product. So I took that shit with me when I made house music. Like, I'm I'm out here DJing and everything. I'm like, shoot. I, I do a party with me, Mike Dunn, Hugo. That's the party. All I got to do is fl pass out flyers. So, yeah, I, had, I was building teams. And when it came to making records, the same thing. I got my the closest person to me. 
it was my sister. So I grabbed my sister. You know what I'm saying? This is how you build it, how you build a team. So I use basketball uh, to build my whole, even to this day. And, and what was what was the soundtrack that you was listening to during the basketball days? <clears throat> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh wow! Because uh, uh, I because okay. I imagine you went through those soul and funk days, and the maze days, and the earth, wind, and fire days, and then obviously later came the Motown days. And well, first it was Motown. For, for yeah. First it was okay. Well, my basketball days in my basketball yeah. days, like. Right? Um, pretty much was what it was on the radio, uh, you know, uh, Lakeside, like your funk stuff, Rick James, um, you know, your, your, your midnight love songs, uh, you know, things of this nature, you know, you know, it, it was, it wasn't so defined yet. I, I hadn't, I hadn't found, I hadn't found, I haven't found house music until I, I like to say like around 19, kind of. 81, 82, or 82 than anything. Um, and what about what about the disco thing though? Did you did you go through your, your disco period first? Did, did you did you have? Like, I mean, uh, didn't okay. recognize that was disco. I, I didn't okay. recognize because again, my whole my whole quest. I didn't even get to the I didn't even get to the high school part yet. But my whole quest was the NBA basketball basketball first second. Third, fourth, fifth, and everything else. Wow! Is after that. Sure, it, it was nothing but. And mind you, I played in grammar school. I was not the best kid on the basketball team. As a matter of fact, uh, my grammar school years playing basketball was more about me being uh, uh, a smart kid, a book wise kid, as opposed to being anything athletic. Go have a backup. Go have a backup. Hey, well. Uh, uh, no offense to my coach, I understand it was better players, but on the side, I had been playing at the, um, let's just say the local gym, the YMCA, right? They had these 13 and under tournaments and stuff. And that's where I would, I, I was playing against other people from other schools, not necessarily uh, for my grammar school team. So I didn't too much care. I know I was getting better. So, I didn't. Sure. I didn't make my high. I didn't make my the first high school I went to. <laughs> I didn't make that team. Which, if anybody knows anything about Chicago basketball, uh, it was called Simeon High School. This is the team. This is the school that had uh, where the guy Benji Wilson got shot right. And they've always had one of the top teams in the state. Jabari Parker, this guy that plays for Miami Heat, named Kendrick Nunn, comes from Derrick Rose plays for play for Simeon. These are all the cats that played for Simeon High School. That was my first high school. Did not okay. make the high school team. Did not. Matter of fact, Bam Bam, give it to me. I'm a man, baby. Give it to me. Where's your child? Could also play basketball. He played on the freshman team or sophomore team at the at, at Simeon. Bam Bam wow. play. Yeah, Bam Bam okay. play. Um, it's mad that like, you played on the same team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we didn't. I didn't make the team. I transferred. Uh, okay. I, I, I did. I did. I did like I do now. I did some some soul searching. Um, there was a time sure. in Chicago where different players from different schools was moving. You know, as if it was like a um, kind of NBA kind of thing where people were you know, getting traded from one team to the other and this, that, and the third, right? So I'm like, hey, sure. how, how, how can I get down like that? What's going on? Who, who, how do I figure that out? Start talking to some, some people. And it, at, all at the same time, um, my freshman and sophomore year, I'm playing basketball, but not for the school. I'm playing against other players that should play on the basketball team. But Simeon is so good that these players also didn't make the team. So they had to also eventually transfer to another wow. school. Like uh, one of these guys, the one I ever know him, his name is, um, uh, what's Lamont name? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I forget his last name. Uh, history but, now. Yeah. Uh, his name is Lamont. I played against him so much in my sophomore year that it made me a better point guard. So when I started looking for schools and playing against other teams, I try to convince certain coaches and the reason I'm looking up because this is a part of my history I really don't discuss so so much. 
but it has a lot of credence to who I am pretty much today as a producer and as a oh, it's artist. All right, so I always found out, okay, where the best tournaments at in the city. My cousin, my uh, one of my first cousin, he also played high school basketball. So uh, I did a summer at his house and we put, we went everywhere. But prior to that, what led me to that was I had a friend who, who writes now for the Chicago Tribune, who was an ESPN writer. Uh, when we were in grammar school, we did the same thing. We went from neighborhood to neighborhood. And you got to understand Chicago. So it's not easy to go from neighborhood to neighborhood <laughs> without some kind of altercation. And it's generally gang altercation. You know what I'm saying? So you got to check in. Man, or because or, or, you know, you, 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 there was a thing back in the day. If you were neutral, neutral I'm just playing back. But if you're playing against some of these people and you're beating them and they're, you know, they're losing, ah, no, they can't stand to lose. Different so story. What we'll do, man, uh, what we'll do is, uh, what we'll do is just, uh, we go, you know what? We'll quit after the second game we win or we'll lose intensely so we can have a free path home. You know what I mean? <laughs> that was generally our intention. So what led me to me and my, right. So with my, my cousin, my first cousin and I, we did the same thing both in the same grade, both played basketball, and that's all we did for an entire summer. So each, my whole point is each year I got better, but I wasn't on a high school team. Then um, uh, uh, in between my, my, my sophomore year, um, I, I found out about uh, amateur athletics, which is now humongous in the States, right? Sure. I did that for two years. I got clowned for my, no, actually my first, my freshman year, look, my freshman year, my sophomore year, I played amateur athletics. I played for the uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. They had a junior, they had a team that they, they sponsored, and that was our AA, my AAU team, who also had college play of uh, potential college players, college bound players, because scouts used to come to those games. And your boy, you, 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 you no knowledge of none of this. No knowledge of none of this until until this guy uh, from Marquette University uh, walked up to me uh, at the game and said, "Hey man, I really like your game." I'm like, "Okay, thank you." You know, some white dude. You know, you think it's a, another coach or some shit. You know, you don't pay attention, but not a college coach. You thinking a high school coach because you know you AAU. That's you big pretty difference. much yeah. man. You yeah, you pretty much you're a free agent if you play AAU. So I'm thinking this. And my coach said, "That's the guy from." Uh, Marquette University. I went for real. So, you know, as I progressed and when I became a junior, um, I transferred schools, as I said. And then uh I I I, I got I was I was good enough. I, I trained, I trained, I, I played so much basketball that I could run with anybody. I'm known not. I'm known wow. in my neighborhood, I'm known in the little parts of the city, depending on where you ball at. Oh yeah, I, I got a name, not. Nah. I know right. to, the, to the point where, right to the point where, when I started, when I started, uh, the other opposing guards looking like, oh hell no, this one, you know, hey, this okay, 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 and then the game is on. Friends of mine from the neighborhood who was on some of these teams. I remember playing against my cousin, uh, his high school team. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it just it just became a thing until I got to University of Wisconsin and was like, you know. I came up here with a with a with a with an idea, but it's I was not ready for the culture. I, I did it like that. Yeah, I understood it was only five percent blacks that went there, but it pretty much was just a ball team and some of the full team. You know, because I was sure. like, oh hell no. Hey mama, listen, um, I'm just gonna come on home and uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I put like this. I always say I was there a week, but I was there for like uh, three weeks, three weeks to a month. Uh, right, <laughs> like look when schools I'm started. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 I, I was there like like because I, I got enough time to play one scrimmage game with uh, with uh, another co another university because we was in a division three. It's like you got division one, two, and three, which is not bad. It's just that it's a smaller school. The student enrollment is small, so it's not a Division One. 
Sure. So we got a chance to play against this guy who later became an NBA player. His name is uh, Terry Porter. And this dude was, I had never seen a point guard play like this ever in my life. The dude could do everything. I mean, I say everything, you name it, he did it. That still didn't excite me. And I still came home. I went and played for the local junior college at this point. <laughs> I said, you know, screw it. I just go ahead and give me an accounting degree and just play local uh, college ball and work my way that way or figure out another plan. So uh, <laughs> midway, right before the season started, I, I got the schedule. It's come time for the uniforms to be handed out. I have my practice jersey and everything. I'm already practicing. And the very dude that introduced me to the culture of house music, my friend Hugo H. or Hugo Hutchison, this guy was on the radio. We went to high school together. He, like I say, he introduced me to my first real house party. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, my soundtrack was kind of weird. It was kind of funk. And then all of a sudden, the Hot Mix 5 and Farley. Well, Farley and then the Hot Mix 5. I have to say it like that because once I heard Farley, then I listened to the whole team. But <clears throat> once he was on the radio in college and I, I got a chance to hang out with them cats, I was like, you know, I think I'm going to do this. So I went down to the coach and said, you know what, coach? Here you go. I'm good, bruv. Um, I'm not going to play ball. This is right before the season. And one of the teams we was going to play, I wanted to play this dude so bad because he be in Simeon, be talking so much shit. He be talking. I said, no, nah, I'm good. Nah, I'm going to kill. I'm going to murder this dude on the court because he has no idea how good I am. I know he's looking at old Tyree and thinking about, oh, they, if they got him, it is easy. Oh, <laughs> contraire, mon frere. At this point in time in my game, it's all over. I'm I'm little Isaiah Thomas, you know, anyway. But at this time, I was like, you know, I'm good, coach. Here. He said, son, you're going to throw your life away. Is it the classes? No, 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 coach. It's all good. It's all good. I'm just going to hang out in the radio room and, and just DJ. I'm, a, I'm just going to be a DJ. A DJ? Son, don't tell me that. You're going to throw your life away. You're going to hang out with those guys. Those guys just, what are they going to do? What, 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 what are you going to do? You're going to spend records for the rest of your life? I don't know, man. I'm just, you know, it looks cool, man. I, I think I'm going to try it. So the assistant coach, he walks over to me, go, boy, you just going to throw it. I'm trying to do his back. I'm trying to imitate his voice best I can. Uh, boy, you just going to throw your fucking life away. You going to hang out with them? With them? Man, you got the potential. We could put you in any. All you got to do is play ball, man. We can put you in any school, man. We can get you in this school. And I'm looking at him like, you know, I know there's a violation in this somewhere. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I'm just going to keep it up. A, a hundred and go, man, no, nah, I'm good. Two years later, two years later, so that happened like 84, right? Just right before. Jesse Saunders, well, right in the mix of Jesse Saunders releasing the first house record, right? I'm like, shh, this is what I'm it's doing. It's on and on. That's on yeah. and on, yeah? On and on, yep. Yeah. I was yeah. like, this is what I'm doing. And hanging out with Hugo and Friday Night Audio and understanding this culture a lot more. Yeah, then, then I got introduced to disco. I mean, I got, you know, like, uh, you ever see The Matrix when, uh, when, when, when uh, Neo first gets first get into the matrix or this this computer software program and they they said yeah we need you we need you to be able to fight to take on these agents and they plugged them in and they plugged them in and say what martial arts style you want to know he say i don't know pick yeah. one and they plugged them in and go well i know kung fu that's what <laughs> <laughs> well you were plugged into the right guys at the right time that's exactly where i was going with yeah. because that opened the door for everything my whole world just went again still play basketball you know occasionally i play with the uh it's gonna sound funny come my mouth i played with the local church uh i would go there for the season that pretty much be it and once the season was over with i was ghost 
won three championships with the with the with the with the with the church. So I, for me, I was good. House music took over everything. I got into DJing, and like I say, two years later, that same coach, that same coach, was at the party and looked at me. He looked at me up and down. Was like, okay, hmm. right. Name plastered on the poster. You you couldn't miss Tyree Cooper on the on the when you walked anywhere down the street. You know, back in the day, you used to be able to put up uh, plug cards or posters, right? You'd be able to put up posters. Yeah, you saw my name plastered everywhere. Tyree, 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 Tyree. Like, Amazing. Hmm. Hmm. I'm like, yeah, all right. I ain't looked back since. Sorry if that's a long story, but... No, it's um, no long story because it's important because at that time, people really never considered DJing to be a career. You know, and and if you think about the DJs today, they're earning you know over a million pound, a million dollars to play a set. Back then, you know, it was considered to be you know, like a bit like an artist job. You know, it's like even, artwork. That's 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 being. I'm that's sweating being, a lot. I'm gonna while you're talking, I'm gonna. Woo. It's cool. It's cool. We got. They say it's actually the hottest time uh, since the '60s here in London. Wow. Well. Yeah, I'm in Las Vegas. Trust me, bro. Yeah, it's every day hot like the '60s. For sure, like, for sure. Times. So house, so boom. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, so so yeah. I told the coach like he saw me there. I hadn't really made my first record, but that was due. And I say that was on his way. That was on his way. And that was another funny story too about me making um uh my first house record and stuff. Right. So uh I know forget a lot of my business, but anyway um. Uh, when I when I entered Simeon, was that I feel the night? That was my was first, that the first one. Yeah, my first one. But I, I had um, I had produced other tracks before that, right? I, I uh, one story I tell, I, I had um, I borrowed Steve. I was I was a drum machine borrowing individual. I borrowed Marshall's drum machine to make I feel the night. I borrowed Steve Poindexter's drum machine to make some some beat tracks because at this particular time. We made beat tracks. Beat tracks was like you could segue in between different songs. If the beat track was nice, you could run that beat track for a long time, put acapellas on it, so forth and so on. Definitely, yeah. Beat tracks so, are a huge thing, even here. Right, right. So I made some beat tracks. And I took maybe six tracks or whatever. I took them down to Larry Sherman. What I thought was mastering, I did them in my house. With the DJ mixer, so the bass and highs were good, the levels was okay. So I'm like, it's mastered in my point. So I, I didn't know there was a such thing as these monitors that can hear stuff, these near field monitors and everything. So I took it down to Tracks Records because at this particular time, I'm on college radio. I'm lying to every record company I can think of to give me some promos. I didn't care which record company it was, I was lying. I was over, I was really, really telling people I was way, way bigger than I was. I just wanted free records. I, I didn't care. If I felt like I liked the company, I would call sure. them up. Right. What, were so, the lab- what were the labels at the time? Tracks Records? Was, was DJ International I, I, around then? Tracks Records was around. I called them up. I got free records. Uh, 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 this record label called Sunset uh, Records. I called them up. Um, AKA Records. I called them up, um, a few other labels. Cause like I say, I was, I was, I was doing my thing. I was. Yeah, for sure, dude. You know, and what, about, was, what about record shops? Was what, was what record shops? Was there many record shops around at the time in Chicago? At yeah. This point? Like, 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 like you had like, uh, import records was, I don't know if there was record war, like. Geographics, right. Like if you lived on the uh, south side, then you had um, you had some. Mom, you had like Hollywood Records. You had like JR's Music World, which is in Evergreen Plaza. If you lived on the west side, you had uh, Barney's. You had uh, 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 what's my man George Daniels? I forgot. Um, um, George Daniels. He had a record store. He's all George Daniels is like the old guy in R. Kelly videos. He's like the older gentleman that's dancing with his wife. Um, <clears throat> I forgot the name of uh, Mr. Daniel's store, but uh, uh, and I used to go there. He know this dude's known me since he's known me since I'm I'm in my fifties. Uh, <laughs> he's known. You look me. good, brother. You look good. 
thank you, thank you. You, you know, uh, you as well. Uh, he know yes. me since I was about six or seven years old, going into the store buying candy because I used to live on the west side, right? But anyway, you had his store, Mr. Daniel's store, and then you had Barney's. Uh, if you was on the north side, you had a little bit more choice. You had wax tracks, you had the gramophone, you had, uh, 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 what is the name of it? Uh, just use record store. Uh, just use record store where everyone used to get records from. Uh, you had quite a few. And if you really wanted to, you went downtown and you went to the Loop or you went to Imports because Imports and Loop would always get the freshest, freshest, freshest. You know, like I said, you had other mom and pop stores, but the reason I didn't sure. mention DJ International because uh, that's when I stopped lying to record companies on how big I was. Because right. I called up DJ International and the guy Benji was, I didn't know who he was. I said, listen, my name is Tyree Cooper. I did this at this party. I'm on this radio station. I'm lying. He's like, oh yeah. I said, I just want to come and get some promos. Is it okay? And this is the time when like, like this, Donnie, I mean, all the heavy songs from DJ International. Yeah, yeah. Was, I was like, you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to clean up here. So I went down there and I talked to him I'm like, yeah, I'm Tyree. Um, you know, I talked to you on the phone. I, I don't know who I talked to. He said, yeah, oh yeah, I talked to you on the phone. Yeah, what you need? What you need? I was like, you know, whatever promo you can give me, man, it's, it's cool. I'm not, you know, I'm always humble and stuff, right? Uh, just whatever you can give me. So he gave me promos, promos, promos. I'm like, all right, cool. He said, uh, yeah, that'd be uh, X amount of dollars. I was like, whoa, say that again? <laughs> he said, yeah, that's, that's X amount of dollars. I'm not going to charge you what I charge the store. I'll give you a good price. I'm like, no, I thought there was promo. He's like, bro, you're not on a major, like you wasn't, on, I wasn't on like the major, major station like WBMX or WGCI. Nah, I was on the college stations. And back then they gave less than two sh- sh- about a college station. They were like, college station? Who listens to them? It's all about the Hot Mix 5 or the Jack Masters 6 or whatever, right? I'm like, oh my. Guys, so I'm like, I can't get the promo for free. He's like, no, unless you pay for them. I'm going. Ah. I say, so what kind of company is this? Y'all, y'all, y'all listen to demos and stuff like this. Like, yeah, dude, if you got one, you know, bring it on down. Oh, for real? Yeah, just bring it on down. You talk to Rocky. I'm like, okay. It took six months, but I can't, eventually came down with a demo. <laughs> I had well, I guess you get, yeah, 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 yeah. I had as an no artist as well, you don't know when to stop as well, do you? No, nah, no, nah, you just ramble yeah. on, dude. Uh, but because I had to borrow a drum machine, I ain't had no equipment. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm poor. Man. I mean, I'm like, yeah. At this point, I'm not even making. I'm, man, goodness, man. Anyway, making each part as but famous. Also, as, you keep doing it, don't you? That, that, you know, that's what I keep. That's what I meant was as an artist, you like, you always like. Well, it's not finished. It's not finished. Let me. Nah, really make man. It. Yeah, especially back in the day, dude. I was like, yeah. how, how, how is Frankie Knuckles? How is Ron Hardy? Getting fifteen, how's Farley getting fifteen hundred dollars a party? I want to do that. At least that's what the word on the street was. How much they was getting, I don't know, but uh, at least that. I'm like, how are they doing that? That's good and money for back was, then. Oh, and this is every week, homie Farley. Anyway, uh, I'm like, how how, how they do that? So uh, you know, I'm like, okay, I got to figure this out because back then I was only making. A weekend, about 300 bucks, tops. Hour and a half here, hour and a half there, about 300 bucks. So I got smart. I was like, you know what? Here, here, here around 1986, my point guard, sk- my point guard skills uh, fell into place. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to keep doing these parties, begging these promoters uh, to, do, to put me on the line up with this DJ, and I know I can outplay this DJ. Screw that, man. I'm going to do so, I did my own parties. You know what I mean? I, I started doing. I started yeah. putting my life together. I was like, "Who can I use? Who's my immediate that that trust me?" Well, was that was what, that the, what you did at the Sheba Disco, my house? Was that yes, was that it? Yes, cl- yes, 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 yes. So, so yes. tell us a little bit about that then. So yes. Sheba Disco. So Sheba Disco. Sheba, you, okay, okay. Yeah. The Sheba Disco was one of those places yeah. before before we got it. Was one of those places that um. Um, used to have like teen party. It, it was an adult club, but on a DL they would have teen 
teen party, so a young adult party. They didn't call it teen, they called it young adult, right? So no alcohol was being served. Whatever they did, they hid the alcohol. And so they had parties. So around 1985, around 80, sorry, around 1983, 84, they belly up. But so if you knew somebody, you can, you know, pretty much rent it for whatever. So my godfather at this particular time, shout out to uh, uh, the, uh, the Ricard family. Um, he, 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 he said, um, cause he was in a motorcycle club, right? He said, listen, we can get this man. I'm like, you can get this club. Say, like, yeah, yeah, we can get this club. Oh, for real? Dude, I can fill this motherfucker up. Excuse me. And I'm saying to myself, and again, that confident, that point guard confidence, like, shit, ain't nobody taking this ball from me. I was like, let me put my team together. I was like, okay. Uh, at one point in time, Mike Dunn and I, we didn't have any beef. We just wasn't speaking to each other. Um, what happened? Well, I, I just tell the truth because when it gets out, and if he, if he sees it up, he like, just tell the truth, motherfucker. Just tell the truth. Or I tell him my truth. Or I'm yeah. telling the truth. I've got, uh, he's lined up to do an interview as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my first DJ partner. That's, that's, yeah. that's my little brother, man. Are you, that, are you still friends now? Yeah. Oh, good, to this good. day, that's still my brother, man. Yeah. Uh, but at, at, this, at this one point in time, what happened was I was with a young lady that I used to see only at one specific time, right? Because she was, she it's always the ladies, man. It's always the ladies. <laughs> so, so it was hot. It was a hot summer. It was a hot summer, and I had the young lady in my house. Now, mind you, I'm trying to do all this before my mother gets home, or before my mother, you know, recognizes what's going on. So they call me up. Hey, hey, Ty, hey, hey, man, Mike got some twelves, and I tell you, we poor. We we built our own speakers. You know, we might. <laughs> we took our grant money before the use for college to pay for books. We bought records and turntables and shit. That's how it goes, dude. <laughs> so you know, so it's okay, Mike, right? So Mike, Mike got turntables, bet. But let me see him tomorrow because I have this young lady in here that you know. Man, no, no, you gotta come see him, man. They, they, he got the black twelves. That's when. You know, if you got a pair of black twelves as opposed to the silver twelves, you you know you you, you were you know you was a shit, right? No, it wasn't yeah, even black twelves. No, it was uh no, he's got a pair of brand new twelves. It wasn't the black twelves. He's got a pair of brand new twelves. So I'm like, all right, cool, fuck it. So I go down there, and again, it was a hot summer. I go down there and I open the door, basement door to my our friend uh um but we call him Pinot. His name is Arnell, but um we call him Pinot. And we open the door. And they doused me with a bucket of water. Oh, they thought that was funny. They thought it was funny. <laughs> they followed my foot. They told me they followed my foot, my wet footsteps, and I was pissed. They followed my wet footsteps all the way back to my house, all the way to my steps, all the way. I'm like, okay, y'all think this is funny? Okay, okay. So, uh, you know, me and Mike, we talked it out. Trust and believe, it wasn't gonna be no fight. I was just a bit pissed because I was with a woman, with a young lady, and they did this, they played this prank on me because I don't play the pranks like that. So sure. at this particular time, That's fair. Um, at this particular time, I said, you know what? Fuck, I ain't gonna, I'm not gonna mess with him. So my point guard brain starts working. Mike was the hottest thing in the neighborhood. I'm outside the neighborhood. I'm doing everything on the outside, or on the east side where, where all the quote unquote real parties was at. I'm doing these parties. Mike is on the other side with the east side don't fuck with. So I'm like, you know what? Hey, Mike, you want to do some parties with me? Yeah. He was a rapper. And so I had Mike. I was like, we, need to, we might need a guest. Let me ask Hugo. Hey, Hugo, because Hugo was on WKKC, the popular radio station that has a wide audience on the south side. So I'm like, I got me a squad. So it would be Mike, Tyree, and Hugo. So when it came down to the Sheba, it was like, hell, yeah, this is it. It's a wrap. And I kid you not, <clears throat> Wayne, we had about five, 600 kids come to that party cool. on a Friday night. On a, cool. Oh, man, it was so crowded in that mug. Oh, it was so crowded. So we was like, my, my godfather was like, fuck that. Oh, my, my God, son, what are you doing over here? You know, we got five, at $5 a head, 
You know what I'm saying? So Good. yeah, Great. man. We he looked at me, it was like and a house night as well. But my house, my house was the name of the night, wasn't it? We called it Club My House. That's right. A Club My House, yeah. Club yeah. My House. Um, um, so within that, we did the next party. The police was not having it. They was like, you know what? Where the license is at? Who, who's running this over here? So my godfather tried to, you know, see what was going on, who was whatever. And it was like, nah, you got to have some, you got to have some permits, man. At least, you know, clean up the joint. So we, we, we cleaned that motherfucker up. We took out the trash. We did everything, everything. We made sure fire escapes. You know how you do when you want yeah, to happen. Yeah. You young and you hungry and shit. And matter of fact, we didn't even go home. We bought a let out couch, a couple of let out couches so we could all sleep in the club. You know what I'm saying? This is dedication. Yeah. So within that, within that time, uh, uh, we, we ran into, I think Mike Dunn ran into Marshall, or I ran into Marshall. I'm not for sure how the story goes. It could be Mike. Uh, ran into Marshall and said, hey, man, we up at this club uh, doing, you know, playing some music. Marshall said, yeah, all right, cool. So he said, hey, is it okay if I bring my music, my equipment down here because it's too much in my mother's house and I want to, I want to, you know, I need a place to have it. We was like, what? What equipment? Like the stuff that you that you made. Now by this time, Marshall already had he was he already had um this uh go wild with rhythm tracks. This this one popular rhythm track that we all played, still can play to this day. And so we was like, and he had uh, I've lost control release, right? So we already okay. know who he is. So when he yeah. said bring his equipment, we was like, hell yeah, motherfucker. So he brought 808, 707, 727, uh harmonizer uh jx8 p uh, seven jx8 p keyboard wow. yamaha uh dx he brought a lot of keyboards we was like get the way out of here what are we gonna do now we supposed to be cleaning up the joint marshall leaves we got we pressing buttons turning knobs and shit and using cassette deck to record because we had no idea how long he was gonna come in and take all this and then we like what so I said, so me, wow. and Mike, so me and Mike said, me, Mike, and Hugo, as a matter of fact, he said, hey, Marshall, man, look, since you using the 707 and you're not using the 808, um, can we get like $20, man, to borrow it for a week? We just want to make some tracks. He's like, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, one week turned to six months. <laughs> as you do? He was but we wasn't trying to steal his drum machine by no means of the imagination. It was that we was trying to take turns on how, who gets what, how much time, what was going on. So I, sure. I'll just say when it was my time, uh, when it was my time, so all three of us working on this track. So, okay, cool, cool, cool. And I, and I guess before that, if you wanted to record music, you'd have to go into you know, a normal studio and record, I guess, which was least, quite expensive. At, at, at least then. that. Yeah, yeah. You, you, know, you, you, had, you had some studios that were eight-track uh, studios, 16-track studios, and then you had the big 24-track studios, the huge, huge, huge studios. But for, some, for, three, for three broke brothers, yeah, exactly, cassette deck yeah. was it. That, that was cassette deck and a little sampler, a little Digitech sampler, just three seconds, five seconds of a voice. Jack, that's all you got. Jack, 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 Jack. You can, wow. you know, you can run it across the drum machine. So, um, so all three of us working on this track, right? So I was like, you know what? Let's get my sister to sing it. Yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. Okay. So we had a practice run, and it was our fit night. So I was like, I bet. So we played it out, played it. I gave the copy to Lil Lewis. He stole my cassette, or he claims I gave it. So I'm like, no, dude, I asked you to play it. You never gave it back. And had I had a few other brothers with me, it probably would have been a fight at the party to get my cassette back. <laughs> so I'm like, nah. So I was like, nah, I'm not going to do that. So um, that's just real talk. That's just... Uh, yeah, look, yeah. That's real. That's, that's what just happens how, when you got good friends. It would have been like that. Right. Um, right. Uh, so I was like, you know, fuck it. Talking up to the game. So I was like, all right, cool. So I'm like, what, man? I'm just going to take it down to... Uh, uh, DJ International. Oh man, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I'm like, why not, man? That's the whole point. Let's bring this shit out. 
So I, I, I took him the song. I took DJ International song. Still had Marshall Drum Machine. I took him the song. <laughs> I miss it. We I miss truly it. Believe, Again, this is I feel the night. Yeah. I feel the night. So, yeah. so I think we think Move Your Body probably have been produced with an 808. But the fact that his only drum machine was the 707, his Move Your Body. Go on. <laughs> so, uh, so I, so I'm like, okay, Rocky Tay, we're gonna we gonna uh we're gonna put in this we're gonna put you in the studio. So I'm like, all right, cool, cool. So I'll call up the guy, hey, which patterns did we use? What was the pattern? Oh, I can't remember. You can, hey, which which pattern was it? Uh oh, I don't know. I don't I don't know. Oh, for real? Okay. Now studio time, we was in a big ass studio. This is a 24 track studio. There's sure. only 10 outputs on an 808. There's a whole 14 more outputs, or uh, 13 more outputs, because you had to put a, a FSK uh, uh, signal so everything can sync up later. Yeah, no, that didn't happen because the 808 does not have a FSK sync tone. It's what you see is what you get. If MIDI, if you admit it to something, that's what it is. Didn't know any of this at this particular time. All I knew was, I got to figure out how to program this right now, right here, so I can release the song. No, not even, no, they didn't say, hey, they didn't say, hey, look, look, uh, pattern three, four is what we use. Uh, uh, And the other one is seven and eight. Because then I could have put it in song mode and just like, okay, you know, run it. But I'm not saying that. I'm like, shh. I'm I'm, I'm like, I'm sweating. So I just started racing patterns. And I, I did what I thought was what we did. And that's what you hear in After the Night. Wow. Because they didn't tell me. It might have probably disputed, but I don't care. But I do care. I love them. But uh, this is what they didn't tell me which pattern it was. So I'm like, fuck it. And then uh, Benji, the same guy that sold me the records at DJ International <laughs> uh, uh, Record Company, was in the studio. And I quote, he said, Damn, motherfucker, you don't know the pattern of your song? You don't, you don't know what, what, why you got a cassette playing? No, 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 no. I just can't remember which one. And I'm sitting like, and then at, at some point, like five minutes or some stuff like that, I just gave up. I was like, man, fuck it. I started doing my own shit and got close to what it is. All the, all the stops and everything, that's me stopping the drum machine, starting it back up. That's all me because I thought this is what we did. And so I feel the night came out. My sister singing. She was six months pregnant. So, wow, amazing, man. Yeah. And and so at the time, you guys were in Chicago. Did you know what was going on in New York or in the house scene? And with you know Frankie and all those guys. No, what we what what was? I mean, oh, that's a funny, that's a funny point, story. That's a funny yeah, story. Because you, you know, even like, uh, uh, sorry, we'll get back to that. But you know, sorry. even like the term house music. Mm-hmm. You know, did everybody accepted the term house music? I mean, where would you say the word uh, term house music came from? Um, it, it Look, when the older cats would go to see Frankie Knuckles at 206 Jefferson, right? Um, they would always say they're going down to the house, right? Because he was playing this, this, this kind of R&B disco music. It wasn't necessarily electronic. Uh, but it was like this R&B. So the warehouse was, that was the warehouse. They was going to the house. When the scene, when we, when the scene, when the scene, as the scene was developing and the warehouse was closed and he opened up the power plant, take out the where, use the house to associate the culture with this type of, to associate yourself with this type of culture. Right? It, it, per se disco, it's the warehouse music or stuff that could have been played at the warehouse, right? So when you see flyers, you see flyer, old flyers that say house music, house music, but there was more disco played in these parties. Now, as the world know house music, it, it, to me, after Jesse signed his release on and on, it wasn't the on and on that 
everybody was clinging to. It was the other side. It was the tracks that, as I said before in my previous uh, speaking, mentioned it earlier about me selling my records to track, it was the beats that you can have segues into some of these songs, right? Sure. And after a while, there wasn't that much segue into house records to disco records because the house record, the track itself had a harder kick, right? So it made the disco record stand out. This is something Farley said on his own, right? Which is true. The, the record, the track made the disco record sound, made the kick sound that much more because you had speakers, you had bass, you know how brothers is. We got to have, we got to have some bass. You can't be coming with sure. no tweeters and so I said, we going to, so, you know, 